great companies take 10 years to build at least. And so you just cannot do this in some kind of short, sharp sprint. There's a real ethos in our industry that's very kind of, if it isn't working, just work harder. Just take a sleeping bag into the office and do a few more hours and do an all-nighter. And I really, really think it's stupid. It simply doesn't work in the long run. Welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor, the podcast on a mission to raise aspirations and inspire the next generation of category defining founders. From purpose led entrepreneurs to Olympic champions, you'll learn firsthand from today's successful leaders on what it takes to be brilliant, all in just 40 minutes. For our penultimate episode of this VC feature, we're joined by Saranga Chandra Tilaka, OBE former engineer and entrepreneur, and now a general partner at Balderton Capital, one of Europe's leading early stage technology venture capital firms. Before joining the world of VC, Saranga found Blinks, an intelligent video search engine, which he took public and reached a peak market cap of $1 billion. Now mainly investing at Series A, Saranga has backed some huge names in the world of tech, including Tessian, Wave, and BeautyPie. I can't wait to dig into Saranga's journey as a founder, hear more about what got him into VC in the first place, and hear his take on the future of tech in the UK. Saranga, welcome to 40 Minute Mentor. It is a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, You are an OG of the VC space here in Europe. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. So how are things? Well, thank you for having me on here. Um, It's really great to be be here. Um, And that was an incredibly kind introduction. I'm not sure it was entirely true, but definitely very kind. Um, No, I'm, I'm doing great. Good. Well, the sun is shining. Uh, we're recording this at the end of London Tech Week. So all the great and the good of the tech world and uh, politicians and, of course, investors have been uh, out and about across London. It seems like the perfect time to get you on the podcast, to hear all about your career, the state of VC and tech, and give lots of actionable advice and mentorship for our listeners. So we're going to warm you up, as we always do, with some quick fire questions. So please finish the following sentences after me. My first ever investment was uh, in a company called Cloud9. The deal I am most proud of is? Being a founder and investing my own time and a little bit of capital in that business. Love that answer. I wish I could have invested in? So many companies that it's impossible to recount them all in one sentence. <laughs> There's no like major one that you, you passed on that has gone on to just be like epic Decacorn or anything like that. No, no. Uh, I mean, there, there's too many, unfortunately. Um, too many. Yeah, I think as a... As a firm at Borderton, we collectively, I wasn't there at the time, but we collectively regret Spotify. That was the one that we saw that we should have done, that we didn't quite get there. So that was a big mistake. The hardest part of being a VC is? Saying no to founders who you really like, but businesses that you can't back. Yeah, that's, that's a common one and, and makes total sense. I guess it's about making those decisions and it? it's just a, a day-to-day part of the role. Final question. The one thing I'd like to change about VC is? That's easy. Make it more diverse. Couldn't agree more. And uh, that's definitely something, a topic we're going to talk about a bit later in the conversation. So thank you very much. Before we dive into your career, I think it's always nice to start at your childhood. And I'd love to learn a bit more, and I'm sure our listeners would too, about how your childhood shaped the person you are and the leader you are today. I was born in Sri Lanka. This, which is where my very long name also comes from. But I actually moved to the UK relatively young. Uh, my dad uh, was an academic. He had grown up in an incredibly challenging sort of way. I mean, he, he, he grew up in a sort of two-bedroom, two-room hut in the middle of Sri Lanka, but was really smart and won scholarship after scholarship to sort of ed- get himself educated through school and then university. And he ended up doing a PhD in, up in Manchester in England. And it was after that that he came back to England to, to, to pursue a science research career. And that's what brought me here. And, uh, and then, yeah, I had a great childhood growing up in Manchester mainly. Um, spent a few years also in Fiji, where his career took him for a while. But then ultimately went to college to do computer science. And the other half of my upbringing, obviously, is my mum. Um, and my mum comes from a sort of self-made business family, also in Sri Lanka. Very, very different background. My dad is a real academics academic. My mum's family, including my mum, are really entrepreneurial. She ended up being a teacher, but she was still, she still was and still is a very entrepreneurial person. And I think that's definitely had a big part on kind of where I've ended up. On the one hand, I love the technology and the science of, of what we do in the tech industry. But on the other hand, I've also always been focused on how that can be used to build businesses and build commercial opportunities and not just 
pursue the science for the science sake. And so between the two, I've been quite lucky. They've sort of really allowed me to create an exciting career over the last 10, 20, 30 years uh, doing a bit of both. Amazing. What a combination. And you mentioned there that your education and in the intro questions, you referred to your experience as a founder. So I'd love to dig a bit deeper into that. Can you share for our audience a bit more about pre-VC career and ultimately how you ended up in entrepreneurship? I mean, I've always been interested in the idea of success and of sort of being able to do something that's known, that is kind of meaningful and also that perhaps could generate money. And I think, you know, so I grew up in in, in sort of a fairly working class part of Manchester. And in that part of the country, really, I think, you know, most people assume that the only way you can do any of these things is to to be a celebrity, uh, or maybe to be a footballer. I didn't see any obvious talent in me to do either of those things at all. And so instead, I always sort of looked at other ways I could do this. And actually, one of the things I remember very, very early on, probably when I was about eight or nine years old, reading a random magazine article about Bill Gates and, you know, and his story of setting up Microsoft and everything else. And I never really sort of encountered this idea that someone could start a company, that they could build a really big company, and that it could be an interesting area. I think at that point, for me, businesses were generally quite boring. There were things like shops, which I didn't really have any interest in. And so that was what I think really sparked this idea that, that you know you could do this sort of thing and you could build this sort of thing. At about the same time, my dad brought a computer back home from his lab for some work that he had to do overnight at home. It was that era where you know, it was BBC Micro, it didn't have any games, so you couldn't really play anything on it. So the only way I could get fun out of it was to actually try programming. And that's what I did. And so the two kind of ended up marrying together. And so I've always had this sort of combination of the two ideas that technology was somehow this interesting route to interesting things. Dreamed a lot about starting a company as a child. Then when I was at college, me and a, a few of my good friends started a company, it didn't go anywhere, but it was it was really fun thing to sort of do and think about and set up. So it's always been at the back of my head that it was something I wanted to do. Now, I graduated into the dot-com crash, unfortunately. So it was sort of not a great time to start a company. But the jobs that I ended up doing eventually as a software engineer took me to San Francisco, to Silicon Valley. And when I was there, I think that kind of early desire just re- got reawakened. I mean, you know, it's one of these parts of the world where everybody you meet seems to be starting a company. And so it was easy for me to then think, hey, I can do this. And so me and a good friend of mine started work on a project that eventually became became our business. For those that don't know, do you mind sharing a bit about what the business was and what it did and uh, yeah, a little bit about that journey? Because I know you ultimately took it public, you know, obviously had so much success. The company's called Blinks and it was founded by me and my good friend, Matt Skybella. And we both have software backgrounds. We're both computer scientists and engineers. And we were working for a company called Autonomy at the time. And we were given time, we were allowed to sort of spend time working on sort of side projects, um, a bit like the sort of famous 20% time at, at Google. We used that time to come up with a whole bunch of different ideas. And basically one of those ideas was around new kinds of search engines. It was sort of related to what Autonomy was doing, but it was a bit different. Autonomy always sold their software to large enterprises, and we were interested in applying the same kind of tech to consumer problems. And basically, to cut a very long story short, this concept had legs, and it seemed to get a lot of traction. And so in the end, we did a spin out from Autonomy, and we became the official formal founder. So I was the CEO, he was the CTO, and we built the business from there. And I think one of the really interesting things was, because we were both technical, we started off very much focused on building really great tech rather than necessarily thinking about exactly what the business model was going to be. We had a very kind of, we'll build it, it's really amazing, people will come, people will pay kind of attitude. And of course, that was quite painful in the early years. We had to experiment with three or four or five different business models or pivots, as you call them these days. But eventually we got that and we found a business model that really worked. And basically what it was, summarize it, was that there was this technology that would find video content online and process or analyze it automatically. And it would use things like speech recognition and visual analysis to break down what was going on in that video. And then that made the video searchable, but also importantly, it meant that you could find the most valuable or most relevant ads for each of these videos. And that engine, this sort of targeting between a person, a video they might want to watch and an ad that might be relevant to them, turned out to be a really powerful commercial flywheel. And we built that business from zero up to 200-ish million dollars of revenue every year. So it was a very fast growth um, journey at that point. I know it had a 1 billion dollar market cap at one point you ipo'd it so many incredible uh, learnings i'm sure along the way people in tech and people from outside often see the the unicorns and the, the exits and all that and it all just looks so glamorous and amazing 
But the reality is, whether it's uh, running a 10 person business as I do, or, uh, you know, a huge one like you did, it's not always uh, fun and games. For anyone that might be going through that journey at the moment, do you mind sharing some of the harder parts of that journey? Because I think it's important to, to be realistic. I always say this, you know, the, the summaries of these things always, of course, highlight the sort of five or six amazing kind of high watermarks, if you will, uh, of a journey like this. And, and they were there and they were real, but at the same time, there were many, many more, frankly, low watermarks of various sorts. And, you know, just to give you sort of a simple anecdote of that, I really distinctly remember, so because we were in online video, we had lots of partnerships with different people who create video. And I remember as a result of that, MTV invited me to the MTV Music Awards. And I remember going to that and we had like the VIP seats uh, sitting right at the front. I remember watching Madonna perform and it was an amazing experience, this incredible evening, cool party afterwards, of course, all of that kind of stuff. And I got back to my hotel at probably about 1.32 in the morning. I opened my email, I had about 400 emails, but in particular, at that point in time, we were struggling with a really, really tough quarter, which I knew we were gonna miss. Our share price was riding quite well recently, but I knew that was gonna collapse. So there was this kind of horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach about how that was gonna come down in a dramatic way. It wasn't gonna destroy the business, but it was gonna be a pretty awful thing, I think in about a week's time, where I'd have to go and tell the world the numbers weren't right and or weren't as good as we'd hoped. And then, and then everyone was gonna be very negative about that. And at the same time, we had a really unfortunate litigation situation involving two employees who'd fallen out, a manager and their direct report. And there was kind of a whole legal process that obviously the company was dragged into as well. And in the end, you know, that all got resolved fairly amicably. But at that point, it was really at the heart of it. And you could see, you know, it's a combination of like people, both people you'd liked, who are now really upset, and the legal risks and challenges and the costs involved and lawyers racking up thousands of dollars worth of bills. And so it was this real juxtaposition of on the one hand, you feel you should be on a high. At that point, probably a 1.2, $1.3 billion public company. It's been this like incredible event that you never thought you'd ever get invited to. But then you then you couldn't sleep because everything was also going wrong at the same time. And I think balancing that is really, really hard because as a founder, you know, when you're at the MTV event, you're not just having fun, you're presenting a really positive really optimistic face because you've got to because you're meeting potential partners advertisers you know all these sorts of things that are really important to the business you also know behind that facade that there's lots of things going wrong so when you go back into that hotel room and back onto that email you've got to deal with all those and i think it's that stretch between the realities that you have to constantly bridge as a founder that i i found really tough Thank you so much for sharing that, uh, because I think it's a reality for any founder that there are often these amazing highs and sinking lows, and you kind of get used to it, don't you? You do build that resilience, and perhaps the lows, you bounce back from quicker, and you learn perhaps not to over-celebrate the wins over time. I read that you described being a founder as a really quite a shitty job, which I, I <laughs> made me chuckle, because uh, as somebody that's been through the trenches on this, I totally would agree with that. You know, given that you've said that, why would you still encourage people listening to this that have a great idea to become one, despite how challenging it can be? I stand by it. I think I think it is a really challenging job and it's a very lonely job. I think that's actually the worst bit of it is that you are, you know, you tend to feel a little bit on your own. Even if you have a co-founder, I think and that can really help if you've got a great co-founder like I did. But even then it can sometimes be terrifying. Why it's worth doing, I think is, first of all, if you have a sort of particularly unique idea, you know, if, if you think there needs to be something that's changed in the world, I, I still think that starting a company is the best and the easiest way to achieve that change. Now, there are other ways you could do it. Maybe you do a lot of press and media and PR and try and get, you know, try and get reported on in, in the news. Maybe you become a politician. You know, maybe you go and lobby people of various sorts. I, you know, there, there are other things you can do. Maybe you, you know, maybe you use the courts as a way to sort of push your opinion or your position. All of these things can work, but I, I honestly think that the way the world is set up, particularly if you live in you know, Western Europe or the US, for example, sort of broadly capitalist societies, actually starting a company is the best and the easiest way of doing it. You know, we spend a lot of time removing friction from the process of building a company. And so you can do that, you can start that. And actually, if you're right, if your theory was correct and people resonate with it and people want to agree with it and go along with it, then it's very easy for them to be part of it by being a customer or a partner or whatever. And so I still really think if you've got this idea that you want to change something about the world and it's a big idea and you think it's something that other people haven't figured out and that you believe there's an opportunity to make it happen, forget about the personal accomplishment that might come from it. If you actually want to make that change, starting a company is often the best way of doing it. And so that's, I think, the primary reason you know anyone should start a company. The other sort of less glamorous sounding, but I think still really important reasons 
are just the skill set that it gives you. You know, as you know, being a founder and not being an employee, you know, you, you just have to get on top of so many different things. You need to understand all these things from selling and marketing to technology and product, from legal and finance to HR and culture. And of course, if you build a larger company, you will inevitably hire people who will do certain parts of it for you or with you, but still end up learning about all of it. And just the skill set that that provides you is amazing. And I think it just it gives you a confidence about operating in life generally. You know, you kind of know how the world works in a way. And I think that's just a really powerful thing. I mean, I've spent time with people who are incredibly accomplished people, but we've only ever done one job. It's amazing how when they step out of that comfort zone, they don't really have the sort of confidence necessarily to figure out what this new world, will, how it will operate. And again, I think as a founder, even if your business is not particularly successful, you, you know, you have to get your arms around that stuff. I think it's a brilliant journey. Like I'd say, I do a bunch of stuff with schools. You know, one of the things I always say is, look, if you have this desire in you, like just do it once. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work out. Do it when you're young. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter if it doesn't work out. You, you can always go and get a real job later. But just the, the journey has so much value in my mind as well. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And I always said that when I made the decision to set JBM up, I didn't have a lot to lose. I was 25. I'd only been really working for a couple of years. And I learned more in that first six months than I did in the previous three years. And I'd probably, if it had failed miserably, I'd still really take a lot with me from that early days about understanding how to prioritize cash flow. My uncle was drilling it into me and just selling and creating propositions. There's so much to it, as you said. I think that's so true. Switching gears slightly, you obviously moved out of founder life into VC. So I'd love to learn a bit about why you felt that was the right move for you when you did. And how you found that transition, because I guess for some, it may be quite hard to let go of being a founder or an operator. I'd love to hear how you found it. Yeah, I think everyone's different. You know, I have many friends who will never stop being a founder or an operator. And that's great. In my case, I had done it for about a decade. And honestly, I was exhausted. I talked earlier about the sort of unique stresses of the job. And I think I faced a bunch of them. It wasn't like I had a sort of sudden moment of burnout. I was lucky that way. That does happen to a lot of founders. But in my case, it was more just a sort of general <laughs> feeling of just being dragged down, having spent just so much time doing it. And what I always found in life, and I, I think this is sort of key, is that, you know, if you want to do something for a long time, and it's a sort of tough job of, or, or tough pursuit of any sort, then it's really important to balance it with other things. For different people, that's different things, right? Some people have to do physical exercise. Some people have to spend time with their family. Some people uh, have other hobbies that are really important to them, whatever. But it doesn't really matter, but you have to do that balance. I've done a reasonable job of that. You know, part of what drove me to sort of get through the hard times was the feeling of kind of what was going to come next and what I would learn next and what part of the journey would happen next. And I got to the point with the business where I realized that, that really ahead of me for the next five, six years was was pretty much the same thing I'd done for the last two or three years. In other words, we were a successful, highly profitable company, mid-sized tech company. We were probably growing at 20, 30% every year, in a good year, 40%, in a bad year, 20%. And we were public and we were just going to keep growing, you know, and the, the market cap would have kept on growing. I would have kept being paid more and more money, but really nothing was going to fundamentally change. It was a successful business, but it wasn't obvious that there was a big step change. And so at that point, you know, I spent a bunch of time looking at could there be a step change? Was there some new product or some new idea that we could launch that could be our sort of second coming? And I couldn't see that. Creatively, I just didn't have that idea. And it was at that point that I thought, you know, without that motivation of the next big thing, I'm going to find it really hard to find the energy long term to keep going. And so I told that to my board, it's a difficult discussion, as you'd expect, but ultimately they got on board with that. And then I actually spent almost a year and a half figuring out who could take over. There were two fantastic candidates in the business. One of them ended up being the right one. And, and he took over and he was a brilliant CEO then for the next five, six years, I think. And I just became chair on the board. So I did all of that first. That was It was very much about me um, and the end of my time at Blinks, at least as a CEO. And then what I did was I took a couple of years off. And that was an amazing period of time. I was very lucky. My wife was super busy, but we had our first child. He was a little toddler at the time. I, I'd not spent enough time with him in the first couple of years of his life because of my job. And then I got to spend two fantastic years being the stay-at-home parent and the stay-at-home person in the, in the marriage. Um, she was working for a startup, so she was working all the same insane hours I had been. And yeah, that was amazing. And it just gave me this brilliant break from it all. And it was at the end of that, but thinking about what to do. And we talked about coming back to Europe. And a friend of a friend had connected me to Borderton and said, look, if you're going back to the European tech ecosystem, you should talk to some of the VCs there. 
because you know they're really connected. That thing about being your VC is that you're inevitably you're the hub of the wheel. And they said you should go talk to those guys. They'll know what's going on. They'll be able to give you ideas of what you might be able to do back in Europe. And that led to me meeting my now partner Bernard Lioto. It was supposed to be a 15, 20 minute coffee turned into like a two hour conversation. Uh, where I think we found that we were very kindred in certain ways. I mean, he's also European, he's French. He also started a company in Europe and took it to the US and lived there for a decade, took it public, and then came back and became a VC. And he just convinced me really in that conversation that this could be a a really good second job for me. How would you say that your founder experience has helped you as an investor? And do you think more founders should make that move to becoming a VC? And if so, it'd be great to hear any advice you have for them. I think it makes a huge difference. You know, it's really about empathy more than anything else. You know, you're, as you know, your individual founder journey is too different from every other one to really be sort of directly factually useful. I mean, there, there will be times, right? I mean, in, in your business where you meet someone who's doing something very, very similar, maybe in a different market, and you can give direct advice between each other for, for things you've seen. But most of the time, it's more about just the empathy of knowing what the journey is like and sort of knowing what the useful questions to ask are and what the less useful questions to ask are and how to just be a support, really, more than anything else. I think that works really well. I think that when I work with my founders, we build a very special relationship together because of that, because I think I have a sense of what they're going through. And that allows us to have a very close relationship. And I think if you're an early stage investor like I am, you know, you can't just write a check and hope it will all go well. You have to be there. You have to be engaged. You have to be involved. We call it being in your corner. And I think it's a really important part of of what the job involves. Having said that, it's not the only kind of background that can make you a great VC. You know, I I really think some of the most iconic venture capitalists on the planet who've been way more successful than me, at least so far, don't have a founder background at all. And and that's absolutely fine. I think it does work. What we found as a a team at Balderton is that it's great to have people who have different backgrounds because... There are times when someone who's got more of a finance background is exactly who you want advising you and helping you with a particular problem. And then there are times when who you want is someone more like me who you know, won't have all that finance detail, perhaps in the subtlety and nuance of that, but will you know, just be able to understand perhaps the personal journey you're going through and things like that. So it, it has been really useful and I've really enjoyed it. I think the only challenge with it is that you know, sometimes you can't help but get itchy about wanting to be working in the company itself. And that's really inappropriate, right? There's a, there's a definite divide with investor, you're a board member, you're not an operator anymore. But there are moments when you're like, oh, can I be part of that? Of course, you, you can't be. Are you ever tempted to go back to being an operator or founder again? Or is that ship sailed? I think it's sailed, honestly. Um, I mean, I, I know, as you do, how hard it is. It's exhausting and it's emotionally exhausting as well as physically exhausting and mentally exhausting. And I don't know that I want to go through that again, personally. I mean, on the one hand, it, it gives you highs that I don't think you can get anywhere else. I think when things go right, you know, it's such an amazing feeling for you and your team. But the lows are really low. I've done that. I, I think to, to get through those lows, you have to have a mission or an idea that you're just really obsessed with, because that's kind of what gets you through the dark days, dark weeks, dark months sometimes. And I don't have one of those. Like, I, I don't have this, like, burning, this has to change in the world right now things. If I got one of those, maybe. Well, what's this space? <laughs> For anyone that doesn't know about Bolton, I'm sure most of our listeners do. It really is a preeminent VC, back so many incredible companies. I'd love you to just share your take on Bolton's ethos and a bit about why you joined it and the businesses you tend to invest in. So Bolton is a pan-European full-stage venture capital firm. So what that means is that we invest in founders and companies across Europe, from Turkey through to Ireland and Iceland down to, to Greece. And we invest at every stage, really. So from seed to sort of series E or so. We've been doing it for about almost 25 years now. So it's a long time. We've backed about almost 300 companies in that time, some of which have all spectacularly failed, but some of which have really succeeded. And so we've, you know, we've backed dozens have ended up becoming unicorns. We have you know, backed many IPOs. Right now, if you think about companies that are sort of fairly well known that we've backed just from a Consumer point of view, businesses like Revolut, Boy, the scooter company, and so on, but also really, really large enterprise software and technology companies as well. So companies like Contentful and Go Cardless uh, in the fintech space, or companies like MySQL back in the day. A lot of history backing a lot of these companies in different countries across Europe. The core ethos that we talk about is, first of all, we, we believe what I said earlier, which is that the best way to change the world is to start a company. It's kind of what kind of gets all of us excited about what we do. It's the reason we think what we do is important and valuable and useful. And so we look for founders who have that shared opinion and that shared vision. And if they do, whatever it is they want to change about the world, whether it's consumer or finance, whether it's enterprise or deep tech, we don't really care. It's about thinking 
there's something wrong in the world or something I can make better in the world and I'm going to do it by building a business. You're that person, then that's who we'd like to talk to. Um, again, whatever stage you're at. I mean, as a firm, we, we like to bring, on the one hand, a firm that we think is a world-class firm. As I said, we've backed hundreds of companies, many of which have been very successful. We have, by, by being a large firm, we have about $4 billion under management. We've got a really large team that can help you build your company. So not just the investment team, people like me, but also experts in marketing, in talent, in legal, in finance and so on and yet we do all of that we like to think in a sort of very specific personalized way to fit the nature of the challenge for european founders you know like i said earlier we try really hard to be in your corner i mean we've, we've operated in this continent for a long time so we know a lot about how europe is and and kind of what it how it behaves and the regulations and all the challenges that that brings we're also really expert at companies that start here but end up being global a bit like you know my company and bernard's company so if your ambition is to build a business that's large in the US or elsewhere, then we can help you with that journey as well. The final bit about being in your corner is that empathy that I talked about. A number of us are founders or ex-founders. And so we know a lot about the unique challenge of the job. And so we've created a program, a platform really, that tries to provide holistic support for founders and CEOs that goes beyond just the sort of business help, but actually thinking about every other aspect of your life and how you can essentially take care of yourself to make sure that you're someone who can perform over the long term. So it's not something that you just sprint at for a year or two, but it's something you can do, you know, effectively and efficiently and at high performance for, you know, a decade or more, because that's how long it takes to build a really great company. I mean, I loved everything that you said there. And I think the piece around empathy and the platform that you've built providing support in all aspects of life is, is just so important. And I'd like to come back to that in a second. But before I do, you obviously alluded to some of the incredible brands in the Balderton portfolio. So over the years, you will have seen the best of the best founders, you know, the ones with the biggest visions and the most you know, incredible ability to build from the ground up, these category defining companies. There are going to be people listening to this that are aspire to that and are in the early stages of building something and probably fundraising at the moment. So I'd love to know, what is it about those incredible founders that really made them stand out when they were pitching? And two, on the flip side of that, what are some of the red flags or warning signs that make you hesitant when investing? Just so that anyone listening to this, going through that cycle at the moment, can kind of take some tips away. We've spent ages trying to figure this out. And actually, you'll be interested in this because given what you do in your day job, we, we worked with our talent partner at the time to really dig into, let's look at all the founders we've backed. And let's look at also the founders that have been really, really successful. And let's try to create a profile of what the sort of perfect founder looks like. And guess what? The answer is there isn't one. It turns out that the different really successful founders that we've backed and had the privilege of working with have ended up being really different personalities. You know, some are massive introverts, some are massive extroverts, some are, you know, detailed obsessives, some are, you know, big picture types. You know, it, it, it's just amazing how different they all are. And so we've ended up creating, and this is unfortunately secret source, so we can't share it in detail, but but we've created, we've created a sort of quite detailed founder matrix of di different kinds of things we typically see in people who we think end up really building great businesses. And the idea is when we're going through a process of potentially investing in a company, we spend a bunch of time having, you end up doing a lot of meetings that are about the business, the product, the sales and all that kind of stuff. But we always make sure we have a chunk of time to really just spend time together as humans. And it's usually one or two partners with you know, one or two founders. And in that conversation, we ask a whole bunch of fairly leading questions to start to probe into some of these areas. But we also give the answers ourselves, because I think it's equally important that the founder finds the right VC to work with. And, and there are different VCs and they, they have different styles and they're different people. So we, we try to make it a very two-way conversation. But that tends to sort of elucidate a bunch of stuff that I think is, is interesting. So again, I mean, there are many different things, but I think some of the key attributes that you find that people get good at, either they're naturally good at it or they sort of develop it. One is they tend to have some kind of obsessive need to change something, right? They've got, there's a thing that they just think is wrong or doesn't work well. They're a little bit, almost a bit, a little bit too weirdly obsessed with it, you know, and you sort of think, dude, I, I get that that doesn't work well, but is it really that much of a problem? You know, you seem to be able to rant about it for, you know, hours on end. And that's going back to what I said earlier, you need to have that kind of obsession to get through the hard days, right? So that's a that's a really interesting thing for us. Another really interesting thing is the ability to basically, you know, get people excited by this mission that you're on. That's so important because you've got to sell to customers, you've got to sell to investors, you've got to most importantly sell to potential hires, and you've got to get people on that journey with you know, and that's a that's a really hard thing to do. Not everybody can do that. You know, some people have the attitude of, well, I know it's a great idea, you should be able to figure that out for yourself. And that doesn't really work. You've got to be good at expressing that one way or another. 
So that's really important. And then I think the best founders also have this real balance in understanding that a great company is built by different things working really well in conjunction with each other, right? So you can be very into the tech and be a really, really technical person, but you need to also appreciate that in the end, it has to be sold. Equally, you can be someone who's really, really good at driving sales and marketing and the story and the picture and the narrative, but you need to know that you're building something really valuable underneath as well. And so we look for these people who are real all-rounders in that sense. So those are some of the things that, that we look for. I don't know that there are any massive red flags, you know, again, because such, such unusual combinations of people have been great founding groups. Funny ones are always people who have another relationship, uh, siblings or couples, for example. Now, some of them have been incredibly successful, so it's definitely not a red flag. But you always think, oh, like, what's that going to be like? And sometimes it works brilliantly. Sometimes it really doesn't work brilliantly. So there's things like that that are interesting. I also always like the extremes. You know, you get some people who are founders when they're 17 or 18. And there are some people who are founders when they're in their 60s. And we've backed both. And that's always really fascinating. Like, you know, why you do that at that stage in your life. Like most people who are 16, 17, get a job or two first just to get a sense of the real world. And but some people just want to go straight into this. And then equally, some people when they're in their 60s are thinking about how to slow their life down, not suddenly accelerate it like crazy. But again, they're really successful people at either end of the extreme. So it's interesting, but it's not a red flag. Really amazing advice, Sarah. And I'm sure uh, lots of our listeners will be scribbling away on their notepads or iPads from that great advice. The one thing that really resonated with me was just about the importance of selling, uh, particularly when it comes to building your team. Yeah, having run lots of different search processes, whether it's a founder interviewing a for a CEO to take over their role or a COO, you know, we, we know how critical some of these positions are. And there's nothing more galling than them not taking that extra time to really sell and really make it a two-way process. You really see the, the great founders that are able just to really bring people on that journey. I want to come back to the, the point we talked about. You, you've mentioned, you know, how exhausted you were at the end of your founder journey. I've mentioned the burnout that I've suffered from, and eh, so many people listening to this will, will be able to resonate with that. You recently shared in a LinkedIn post that after stepping down as CEO back in the day, you changed your diet and exercise regime that resulted in you losing a third of your body weight, which is, is incredible and had all the positive benefits from that. I know firsthand that you can easily just get in this vicious cycle of working and stressing and, and not eating right and not getting out to the gym or whatever it is. And pictures of me when my daughter arrived seven years ago will prove that very well. What is your advice for busy founders about how they can work smarter, not harder? And why should they really take heed of this advice around prioritizing health and well-being, and particularly from your own experience? Um, I mean, look, I think it's a really important thing. It's important because being a successful founder is a long journey. Great companies take 10 years to build, at least. And so you just cannot do this in some kind of short sharp sprint. There's a real ethos in our industry that's very kind of, if it isn't working, just work harder. Just take a sleeping bag into the office and do a few more hours and do an all-nighter. And I really, really think it's stupid. It simply doesn't work in the long run. Of course, there may be specific days where you have to really, really pull out all the stops because of the nature of the day or the logistics or whatever. That's fine. But the idea that you just keep doing that more and more is, is incredibly naive and immature. And actually, for me, the, the, the best proof of that is to look at other pursuits in the world or other fields where performance matters. If you go and talk to anyone who is a, an elite athlete, anyone who's a professional footballer or an Olympic sprinter or, you know, a Wimbledon playing tennis player or golfer or whatever, they do not do this. They don't, you know, people like that don't run, you know, don't, they don't, you know, sprinters don't sprint every day. They have a whole regime, they have a whole team around them to make sure that on the day that it really, really matters, they sprint that 100 meters as fast as is humanly possible. But around that, there's a lot of rest, there's a lot of sleep, there's a lot of diet, there's a lot of exercise, there's a lot of spending time with your family. There's all kinds of different things, mental health check-ins, and everything around it to holistically make sure you're in the right place physically and mentally and emotionally at the, at the right moment in time. And I think being a founder is very, very similar, honestly. You know, there are moments when you have to perform, but to be able to do that really, really well, you, you have to have the balance elsewhere in your life. Like I say, I, I, I sort of think it's, sad that our industry's taken this long to figure this out, but we're certainly pushing it. We've just launched a thing that we call the founder wellbeing platform. And it's all about looking at yourself holistically in order to ensure that you can perform over a longer period of time, because that's how you'll win in the end. And the research behind this is like there's millions, there's loads of it, right? You know, your creativity, your decision-making prowess, your speed of, of execution, all of these things suffer massively if you haven't slept properly or if you're 
feeling bloated or if you're not happy you know about some other aspect of your life the, the hard bit i think is knowing what it is that's right for you so you know i'm not you know like a gym person for various reasons but there are other things i do that i really enjoy physically you know for me to start off with it was about walking um i lived in san francisco at the time as i mentioned i had my young son and i thought you know what all this time i've always taken cabs you know ubers and planes to get everywhere because i had no time I'm going to enjoy just having the luxury of spending half an hour walking to the shops because I don't, you don't have to get there that quickly. And I found that that sort of thing made a huge difference to my health. I also enjoy cooking, uh, but I've never had time to do that for like 10 years when I was a founder. And so I came, got back to that. In doing that, I sort of learned more about the food I was cooking and realized that some of the things I was eating, I probably shouldn't have eaten or certainly not in the volume that I was eating. So, you know, that changed everything about that. For everyone, it's a different thing. You know, for some people, it's about, it is about being a triathlete in your spare time or whatever. And that wouldn't be me, but it is for some people. So I think, unfortunately, the, the actual fixers, as it were, are very, very individual and very personal, which is why we've built this platform. The platform that we've built has coaching as well as provision for diet and exercise and sleep and everything else. And I think it's important, therefore, to Step one is accept that you you believe this, that you need to have balance in your life to be a performer um, overall, because I think some people, it takes a while to, for that penny to drop. Once you've accepted that, then you know invest in the time to figure out what the balance is that you need in order to get into the right place to be long-term, to make this sustainable. Right? That's the key word. Like, how can you be in a, what, what do you need to change about your life to have a lifestyle where the job you're doing can be sustained, not just for a few months, but for a long time? You know, and it's okay within that to have some slightly unsustainable peaks every now and again. You know, you know that period X is a busy time in your business. So you're going to be a bit frazzled at that moment. But it can't be like that for a year, you know, or years on end. Then you've got to, of course, implement all of that. And, and again, for each person is going to be a slightly different journey. But I think it's a really important thing. If you're in this for the long run, which certainly we back companies where we believe the founder will take the company all the way. We, we, you know, we never back a company if we think we have to hire in a CEO or something. And so if, you, if you're that kind of person, you're going to have to have some balance. Otherwise, you're going to run out of steam at some point. Great initiative. And I think a really uh, timely reminder that anyone going through this journey, you have to look after number one. You've got to prioritize your health and well-being and, and also you set the right example for the team that are working for you as well we can you know a lot of this comes from the top and it's important we have a duty of care for our teams as well to look after their health and well-being too uh, thank you so much for sharing that Saranga. sadly getting towards the end but but one topic i really wanted to come back to is an area that i know we're both passionate about which is is bringing greater diversity both into tech but also the venture ecosystem is a topic that's come up time and time again on the podcast as a big advocate what is your take on the progress that has been made in recent times and what more can we do holistically but also companies and vcs out there to kind of move that agenda forward we've made progress but we haven't made anywhere near enough progress is my sort of review of the current situation i was a sort of founding advisory board member of diversity vc which is a sort of non-profit that was set up to try and address this issue by another gp actually another partner a venture firm called Czech Warner, um, who's at Ada Ventures. And when Czech and her team set up Diversity VC, the first problem at that point was that people didn't, weren't really aware of the problem or some didn't even think it was a problem. And so what really has been solved over the last few years is fixing that bit. So basically bringing awareness to the problem and collecting of data, sharing of that data, and to some extent, frankly, shaming the industry into realizing it's got a really, really big problem. For me, the reason why it's a, an issue is is the downstream effect the industry has, right? I mean, VC is quite a small industry. It's you know arguably still a bit of a cottage industry. And in, the in terms of financial services, generally, it's quite small compared to other things that go on. So you may think it doesn't really matter that much. But the problem is that the decisions that VCs make, you know, decide where money goes and which companies get a chance at building something big and which don't. And then that means that the downstream effects of diversity have a big problem because if people back people who look like them or who are similar to them or who they feel comfortable with, then all of these big tech companies get built by very, very similar people with a very similar outlook. And they're not bad people, but they just have one outlook and, and not, not all the many outlooks we ought to have. So I think it's a really important thing. I think the awareness problem has really come a long way. I think that the challenge now is to see that change in the organizations. And if you look at the data, what you see, broadly speaking, is that at the very roots levels, it is changing quite rapidly, particularly in terms of, of gender. So if you look at sort of young VCs across Europe, for example, many, many more of them are now women. In many firms like ours, for example, it's over 50%. So that's great. The problem is that hasn't filtered 
through to the to the higher levels of firms. So if you look at partnerships or the investment decision makers, it's still generally pretty non-diverse. So in the case of gender, it's still very male. And then that means decisions, I think, are still not as diversely thoughtful as they could be. So if you look at the founders that are backed, if you're a, a black woman, you're very, very unlikely to get back at the end of the day. Whereas if you're a you know, white man who went to a private school, you many times, orders of magnitude more chance of getting back. That's the problem. I Part of that, we just have to keep pushing. Part of it will take time, which I hate because it feels like such an excuse. That's what we need to do. And then regarding what, what else we have to do, I, I think the biggest thing is the industry needs to do a better job of talking about what it is and what it does and why it's important, why it's interesting to a broader and broader range of people. Many people in the country today watch and know about Dragon's Den. They understand the concept. But what people don't think of is that it's that actually there's a sort of professional version of something that looks a bit bit like Dragon's Den. And it's a job that you can do. If you're a smart, educated person, you can do that job if you think it's interesting. And that's the kind of disconnect that exists. Like I said earlier, I spent quite a bit of time in schools. And when you go in and you talk about, and you just describe what you do as a job, and you don't mention the phrase Dragon's Den, a lot of the kids immediately respond with, oh, that's like Dragon's Den. And there's this moment of, of realization that lights up in their heads that like, oh, and that's actually a job that you can go and like, get a qualification for and do if you're really interested in it. And obviously, it's a difficult job to get and the journey can be complicated and whatever. But and most of those kids won't want to really do it. And most of them won't be the right people for it. But if just one is the right person and realizes and they're from a background where that wouldn't have been an obvious choice, I think that makes a huge difference. So that awareness of what the industry is um, to as broad a range of people as possible is the key thing, I think. Um, and then, of course, we'll need to support them getting into it. So that's a bunch of education stuff. It's a bunch of internship stuff and so on. All of which is there without that individual spark of interest and knowledge and realization of hang on that might be something i might want to do we're not going to get very far we're sally at an end and we have three final wrap-up questions so in one sentence what do you think the future holds for boulderton i hope boulderton will be here for another 25 years doing exactly what we do now the great thing uh, the funny thing about vc is that it really just does the same thing over and over again it's groundhog day but that's okay because every year we get to work with different founders building very different businesses and it's a thrilling job that I hope we keep getting to do. Wonderful and what is the best piece of advice that you can give to founders currently fundraising? Is to convey the passion that you have for what you're doing. I think you know when we look at the founders that have succeeded the thing that's really worked is some kind of drive, some kind of visceral need for their company to succeed for whatever reason that might be and if you can convey that energy i think you'll find backers that will, will believe in you great advice for anyone listening finally this is 40 minute mentor so i've got to ask if you could be mentored by anyone dead or alive who would it be and why i'd actually really love to be mentored by my my grandfather um, who unfortunately passed away when i was about 10 11 years old he was a completely self-made man started by riding a bike between two towns in sri lanka carrying bits of wood between the two and selling, buying them cheap in one place, selling them for a little bit more in the other place. And from there built a huge business that ended up supporting some of his family for generations. And I can only imagine what that journey was like. Love to understand what it was like, how, it, you know, how he came up with the idea of doing it and what drove him, uh, particularly in a country where there was all kinds of challenges around caste and community and all that sort of thing. To do it was a pretty amazing thing. And I knew him, but I never, unfortunately, I wasn't old enough to understand the significance of what he'd done. And by the time I did, he'd sadly passed away. Well, that's a, a lovely answer to finish a fascinating conversation, Saranga. Thank you so much for joining us on 40 Minute Mentor. Your advice and mentorship, I know, is going to be very valued by all our listeners. And I really hope that we'll be able to catch up again in the future. I feel like a number two because there's so many other questions I'd love to ask you. So perhaps we'll get you back on in a year or two's time. We can dive really into the state of tech in 2025 or whatever it might be but thank you for being with us and have a great rest of the summer no thank you for having me it's been really really fun and yes i look forward to doing it in 25 I was beyond flattered when Saranga agreed to come on the podcast and he certainly didn't disappoint. I really hope you're enjoying our VC feature series so far and have been able to benefit from his incredible mentorship. The team behind the scenes are also busy planning series 10, which will see us crack the 200 episode mark. We wouldn't be where we are without all of your ongoing support. So thank you so much for all you do to help spread the power of mentorship. If you'd like to be involved in shaping the future of 40 Minute Mentor, then please get in touch with our producer extraordinaire and head of marketing hannah on hannah at jbmc.co.uk and you can find out more about how to become a 40 minute mentor ambassador that's everything from me today but please don't forget to hit subscribe and make sure you tune back in next week for our final episodes in this series 
See you then.